Welcome back to the Mix Academy, where we're here to help you take the good, the bad, and the ugly of home recordings and help you deliver radio-ready mixes. Today, I've got an interview for you with my man, John Shepard. goes by Shep. Shep recently came to me. Actually, he's been a student of mine for six or seven years, but he came to me and joined my mixing discipleship, where we take on a song of your choice, be it one that you provide or uh, I provide through the catalog here at the Mix Academy, and I mix it with you, then you mix it by yourself, and then we come together at the end and kind of wrap things up, a whole lot of training and uh, just a great start to finish process to help you stand on your own two feet when you leave the program to take on any song and be leap years ahead of where you were when you entered. And uh, John is no exception to that as you just heard. So the interview is gonna touch on his recording process. We're gonna look at uh, drums, the programming, all program drums, all VSTIs in this except for the guitars and the bass, and of course the vocal. We're gonna talk about outsourcing the vocal recording, um, how he chose a singer, the complications that we went through with that, the trial and error we had with uh, different sounds, John's spending, his gas was, uh, his gear acquisition syndrome was in full bore uh, during the Black Friday holiday there, but uh, it's gonna be a great time, great interview. I chime in from time to time, things I did. If you wanna get your hands on these tracks and mix it for yourself, that's available in the Mix Academy's VIP. I'll put a link below. But before we dive into the interview, I wanna share, if you've been struggling with your mixes, you're dealing with average, poor recordings, maybe some things are recorded well, but almost always there's gonna be something that's, that's crap, right? Uh, I've got a free guide for you. It's the fix it in the mix guide. It's not something we wanna have to do, but if you're doing this professionally or as a hobby on the side, certainly going to be dealing with some average or even poor recordings this guy's going to help you with audio repair we're going to look at drums we're going to look at vocals the dreaded closet vocal uh guitars all kinds of stuff i touch on in this guide free for you today check it out link in the description below the fix it in the mix guide and with that let's hop on in we're going to check out uh, this interview with john shepherd drop a comment down below like the video and we'll see you soon all right, so I'm here with my man, John Shepard. John is in the mixing discipleship here at the Mix Academy. We've had a blast working on his song, Stop, an incredible tune. I was super drawn in to the lyrics and his story, his testimony that he has in this song, and then, uh, of course, getting to go hand-in-hand hand with him throughout the production process all the way to the final mix. Uh, it's been a blast, and I thought, what better than to feature John here on the channel show off the song in VIP, students get their hands on it, download the multi-tracks, all that. I'll have links in the description. You can check that out for yourself. But I'm um, here with John, the man himself. John, how the heck are you doing? I'm great. Thank you, David. Thank you so much for opening up this discipleship. I feel like it's going to be something to move me much closer to a professional level of work. Well, and you say that, but John had already been delivering what I felt like was really incredible. I mean, years ago, how many, how many years have you been with me? I'd say six or seven, a but long time, certainly man. not, certainly not full time. No. And, and when you first got with me, you were just a writer, musician, you'd been in and out of, you know, playing in churches and had your own bands. But, uh, from those first, I remember you hired me for a mix critique from those first songs and mixes that you submitted to me to now, I mean, I would call you, you you're a true professional engineer. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And I, I know that I'm the guy that critiques himself harder than anybody else does. Oh, yeah. And in, as much as I respect your opinion, I, you know, it all comes down to everybody's subjective opinion and I have to find a way to like it myself. There you go. And you've helped you... me to get where it <laughs> comes at me in a much better place than where I started at. Man, it, us creatives and our emotions, it can get the best of us, but you are your own worst critic. I'm saying that generally speaking, <laughs> but it's certainly true for you. It's certainly true for me. I go back and who was it? Uh, Phil Tan uh, was on, I think it was a Pensado's interview. It may have been some other interview. Uh, maybe like Full Sail or something. And he said, if he hears a song come on the radio, I mean, this guy mixed, you know, Rihanna, mixed a ton of stuff. And um, he said, if I'm driving down the road or I hear one of my song mixes come on, that you know, work that I was a part of, he turns it off because he's so critical. He's always listening. What could he do better? What could it be? Which is a great thing to have, but 
dang it, it can drive us nuts when we're trying to just enjoy the music at the end of the day. It, was, it reminds me also of uh, Johnny Depp, right? He talks about he never watches the movies that he's in. He can't stand to go back in because he's a part of the creation process. It makes it difficult to enjoy the entertainment value. But, um, man, it's been it's been a blast working with you. We're going to take on another song here soon. But uh, for now, we're going to talk in this interview about the song Stop. I'm super curious um, to to learn more about your creative process. I wasn't there for everything, but then also to uh, kind of share some of the things that we did together. And then ultimately the final mix and master, uh, I'm going to show some before and after samples. Definitely check that out. And I'll have a link in the description you can hear and uh, kind of click through it on your own time as well. But uh, John, your your song, when does it come to you? How long did it take you to write it? Uh, tell us a little bit about the song Stop. Stop started in... 2016 2017 mm. and i had been going through this is the song is all about the relationship between me and my wife between me and god and between me and jesus there are three different distinct relationships spoken about in the song and i was going through a lot with my job i was going through a lot with my son and my grandkids and it i just never was in a position to finish it and literally years passed and i came back to help a church believe it or not that needed sound system help and it's a guy that i've known that's a pastor and has been forever and i started going to his men's group and it just really opened up my thinking and god was talking to me through it and all of this just came to me literally all the rest of the song came to me in about a day oh wow so and then I fashioned everything together and, and, you know, you always have to weed out the, the, the lyrics to make a more concise, whatever. But, you know, I had the music started with the piano and I'm self-contained. I basically call myself the all shut band. You know, everybody knows me as Shep, So I'm the all shut band Jack but of all that's trades. out of necessity. My, well, my, I, to get people that I'm 62 years old to get people to come and make time to learn a song and record their parts doesn't happen very often. Yeah. So I learned, having played around great drummers, I learned how to program drums and to greater or lesser extensive realism. And I'm a bassist, I'm a guitar player, I'm a keyboard player. I like to score for strings and horns. And so anything is on the table. If my ear tells me to, I go back as far as the Beatles and have loved so many different kinds of rock and i love funk and i love stuff that's heavy strings and horns laden mm. so it's possible that a song can start and change two or three different times and the beauty of being the all shut band is nobody ever says wait a minute i gotta rewrite my parts no you don't i'll, re I'll do it for you <laughs> if that makes sense you know i almost wonder uh i'm gonna tease john here for a second if a band might help him narrow the path a bit because you are so hard on yourself that you, I think, witnessing it, went back and re-recorded and swapped things more than I think any band I ever worked with in my 20 plus years in the studio. So, um, but it, he said the all Shep band, John Shepard is his last name. So he you know, goes by Shep and uh, so a little play on words there, but, uh, yeah, incredible, incredible result though. I mean, the upside of being the all shut band is yeah. that I make those decisions. You do all that and I tell the, the scenes. I yeah. tell the guy, Warren Pissarro sang this song for me and I love it, but you heard the raw the original recording. They, yep. They weren't great. And there was, there was a lot of little diction things and like the tonality just seemed like the room was odd. And mm -hmm. so at the end of the day, though, I get to choose that melody line, and I get to choose what's right and what's yeah. not. And as somebody, when when I write it, like the guitar solo that's in Stop, I literally recorded that the first take, had the effects processes on it, played it works. everything is through. There are no amplifiers. It's all uh, yep. the UAD unison amplifiers. And I put the effects on it and i recorded it and i couldn't even send you a dry cut of it because i recorded it processed yeah and it sounded great and it worked so it made the cut it wasn't something that you felt like now the other rhythm guitars or the strings or the piano sound or and then and then right you you were super right. critical on yourself um 
Well, and it, it paid was, off. It was the tonality. It never yeah. sounded like it. Like it. It fit. Together. What you heard in your head and wasn't coming through, and you did. And now here's the, here's a good point. You went to the source. You didn't come to me as the mixer for the beginning of the process. For those who who don't know, mixing discipleship, we start with um, John was a little different because we did some production stuff and arrangement tweaks together and whatever. But um, the process is students come to me. I mix a song with them, either live or on my own time, however they want to work. And then um, after I've mixed it, serving them as a client, then they're going to take uh, the videos and, and watch back what we did together. And then they're going to mix it to um, to follow that same process, but then tweak the taste and, and put their own spin on it. Um, so we did that. But along the way, I was proud to see John was, I mean, he knew what he heard in his head and it wasn't coming through. And so we went back to the source. He didn't come to me and say, I need this and this and this and that. He he expected, uh, he didn't expect me to deliver something that was, you know, to pull it out of my butt there. He went back and said, I'm going to go to the source. We're going to swap the strings. And in fact, I just pulled up my mix before we went uh, live for this interview. My uh, strings, I have an old, I have an original strings old strings folder, a new strings folder, all of them are closed and inactive. And it's a bounce from John from you, Shep, that has your string stereo mix because you blended them and you like the way that they sounded that way. My job is to serve you as my client. And we got that in and you said, you said it sounded great. And so we, we rocked it. It sounded incredible. So um, kudos to you for being hard on yourself, but going back to the source and not trying to EQ or compress your way to a, a certain sound that otherwise the would ugly be part. a simple swap. <laughs> the ugly part is that I had already spent good money on the original source tones, grand piano, yeah. and it's a good piano, but it didn't fit the song. Mm -hmm. So I went out and spent a lot of money to get the C7 and Keyscape. And then I also went out and got modern scoring strings for my string sounds because... Yeah. That's what my ears heard. As I mean, soon as I it heard helped the demo that it was of it, Black Friday. You had some yes. fun this past Black Friday, I got but but I got on the cheap. Yeah, you know, you say the cheap, but cheap is uh, <laughs> <laughs> how you define cheap. But you spent a pretty penny to uh, to make this. I'm retired. If I I've made yeah. my money, and if I haven't made my money and I'm spending it, I'm a fool. <laughs> there you go. No, it, it was great, and the string sounded incredible. The the. What, so what was the original, and it's not that the original was bad, it just didn't fit your vision for the song, but what was the original VSTI you used for strings? I I had been using some uh, VSL, okay. the, the low end of the VSL, gotcha. and then also mixing in some Kirk Hunter string libraries. Okay. Yeah, they and, sounded great. And looking, just... for the, and looking for the ones that EQ-wise matched right and, and like sonically how the bows hit, the strings in that, they, they, they weren't real di diverse like mm. soft hits versus guys that you know like a tina guo that just absolutely beats her cello up with mm. the bow you know so i tried to be good about that but i never got that tone that would meet the softer parts and then the aggressive parts gotcha yeah yeah and at the end of the day that made a huge difference because i was doing less eq and and less futzing with mm -hmm the source material and you got the the emotional ultimately it conveyed the emotion the way you wanted it to these strings the power the yeah, dynamics and what was the the name of the uh, the one you purchased around black friday it is modern scoring strings. modding yeah modern scoring strings can't talk it used to be uh lass <laughs> mm. and uh that's audio bro that that creates it very those cool. guys are really good and they're very helpful too because it's a different animal than any any other VSTI I've ever used. Oh, yeah. And they were great to, it, huh? to help me. Yeah, to help me get where I needed to be. Oh, that's amazing. You know, well, it, it, it turned out great. You did an incredible job with the arrangement. And then, again, to be hard on yourself, but to go to the source and try to get it, get it mm -hmm. right at the source was uh, a big testament to your staying the course on your vision. Uh, and you talked about this song meant, everything to you this was uh i think it was before we started recording you said you've recorded several albums of material over your life and this one you wanted it right more than anything uh so to go back to the source i can't that i mean that's number one message if it's not right re-record it if you can yes and uh, in your case you are the producer the engineer the musician and so you could do that and you did 
Yeah, because nobody, you know, I'm not signed to a label. Nobody's waiting on my product. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That that could be a good thing and a bad thing when you have no deadline, nothing to to push you up against. That that can be. I, I certainly struggle with that, but at the end, it well, turned out great. My joy, my my big hope is to have the joy of being published for the first time in my life. There you go. Well, you, know, you just I mean, retired. At that point, then at that point, then maybe I will get pushed a little harder. And who knows? I think I perform well under pressure. Mm. I, my job was always pressure every nice. day of my life. And you got so it done. And and so, now I'm retired, so I got a lot more hours and a lot exactly. more Exactly. That's what I was going to say. So I would say you've been professional quality for the last several years, obviously always learning. Uh, you alluded to that when we were talking before. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, you're, you're now you're, this is your first project from officially being retired, your first single. And the sky's the limit, I think, for, for your writing ability and everything. So um, I'm curious to dive into... The process we talked about the strings uh you mentioned that you hired warren uh i remember you, i encouraged yes. you to sing it because i thought you had an incredible voice you didn't want to do that and so i recommended uh studiopros.com and a couple others was it studio pros that you mm -hmm. ended up going with uh sound better soundbetter.com okay cool yes. so you found him on sound better and I, he's on multiple now that i've looked yeah. more around cool and the guy's incredible i mean he was on uh, Star Search, and okay. he was on a couple of New York shows. He was in a band called Curve, and the guy has an incredible range. Got he can sing pipes, everything. Man. At 57, he can sing everything that he did at 27. Yeah, and, and his voice, again, I think we we listened to a couple different people. Um, mm -hmm. That's where we listened to some people on StudioPros.com, and again, the great voices, but it just didn't fit the song. Um, right. And then Warren, his tone, oh, just fit it perfectly. So if you guys haven't already heard it, I'm going to uh, link it below where you can go check it out. Um, you can hear it before and, and after on, kind of thing. And It's on uh, Discord under the monthly mix stuff. Okay, cool. So for you members, you can go straight to the Discord, and I'll put a hashtag to that, and uh, you'll be able to click over and, and see that. But um, So vocally, you found him on Sound Better. Warren, and what's his last name? Passaro, P A S S A R O. Right on. Yeah. Okay, so we're kind of jumping ahead, but now that we're into vocals, tell me how was that process? You um, did you search out multiple people on Sound Better, and then you found him. Maybe talk through a little bit of how you chose Warren, found him, chose him, and then maybe what the recording and back and forth because it wasn't as simple as send him the song, get a recording back, and thank you. Here's your payment, and we're done. There's very much a creative back and forth. I probably looked at 50, 75 singers before I hired someone before him mm. because I was so tired of looking and it was a younger guy. And I thought, hey, he's got the range to hit the notes, but he had some vocal uh, quirks that I absolutely, every single line ended up trailed off, mm. every single one. And he changed my melody in a lot of ways to suit the way he wanted to sing the song. And I, you know, you know, I, I sang the song myself and gave him a copy of me singing it as yeah. a guy mm -hmm. where after that failed, you know, and I paid for that failure. So I finally, I'm serious. I had to have looked at another 75, a hundred people. I before I found you. <laughs> one. I'm serious. I mean, I listened and thought over things and I found Warren and I, approached him about it and he was so gracious i'm i will sing this any way you want i will sing it as many times as you want mm. and i will sing any additional vocals you want this is a testimony song and to me this is the source of sounding like it's the singer's story yeah and not the guy that wrote it you know he and he grabbed my song and really did deliver it there was a lot of little small things uh differences in that i couldn't fix pitch wise with sure. either of my two standard pitch things because you know you move a note a half a step or a step not a big deal but in in the phrasing small mm -hmm. things things that just didn't hit the groove just right and that warren went back and redid it no nah, that's so cool you know, like, I, but i did a ton a ton a ton of editing still and as much in melodyne stretching a note a little longer but in the uh oh spit it out john 
the uh oh gosh on on the track the gain clip gain yeah literally clip gaining out eight dbs of the very beginning and bringing it up and there's a little hole and bringing it up an extra two dbs evening that performance out without over compressing it didn't the original recording he recorded it again because the original wasn't it like he committed eq and compression to it do i remember that correctly yes Yes, and we were like oh um man what a voice but that can't that can't happen and then he was like, ah, no problem. And he took off the processing and we were like, oh, okay. <laughs> right, right. And it worked out. So, yeah, but I remember but I am you did. So picky. You did a bunch of things. Um, and this is not necessarily, uh, it, you know, I have a friend, Jairus. His voice is heavenly, man. What an incredible gift. But his S's. Right are, I got to do the pencil mm. trick, the stocking trick, the double pop filter, like... Oof, the mic above him and the S's still somehow pierce the the uh, the transducer and um, mm-hmm. uh, so it's just one of those things. It's some our voices sometimes we have more mouth noise than others or whatever. And um, uh, well, that and was my certainly pickiness. the case with Warren. We had some some quirks to get through, and so that's what editing and you know got us to the finish line. But um, so so you found him. He did the work. Did an incredible job. And then you took over from there. You got in with uh, pitch correction, Melodyne, you, you alluded to, uh, breaths and starts of phrases. There were still some mouth uh, noises, so you got those cleaned up uh, the best we could. I even did more on top of what you did. Um, but uh, let's see, what what else could we say about the vocals? We got, um, I, I asked for harmonies. I remember that. I was like, man, how beautiful to have harmonies. And Tell me why you pushed back and you didn't want harmonies it, in the song it was a it great goes reason. back to this being a testimony song mm-hmm. i i wrote this as my testimony towards my wife towards god towards jesus and as what was said to me and how it took a long time for me to palette it and then respond to it in the right way so that i could write the song i had to change physically in my heart and in my brain to get the song to for god to speak to me and Mm. say this is what you're supposed to say about so that's the where the 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 testimony is the most important part of it i don't want people listening as a as a christian song number one i don't want people listening to harmonies and so much stuff and granted yeah i've got strings and i've got guitar parts but at the end of the day it's a fairly sparse mix but it's a big mix but you wanted um, that single voice. I don't want them voice. listening. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And I want people to, because I think the words stick out more when just that guy and a guy with such an emotive delivery as Warren, because he yeah. can push, he can do soft, he can do breathy. I mean, he's incredible. And we have plans to do more work together. Oh, that's so exciting. How the, the internet brings us together sometimes. <laughs> it right. can definitely rip us apart, but how the joys when it... <laughs> creates friendships and and that kind of thing so uh so vocals we get that done with warren and um Mm -hmm. let's go back so how do you start your songwriting process and how does that maybe stretch into the official production pre-production recording process i started this on piano i've got a uh yamaha mo xf Mm. and i've got some really nice samples inside of it that are non-yamaha and i if I hear something, I sit down and start playing it. Nice. And in it, then I end up starting to hum, you know, like, mm-hmm. not exactly the melody, sometimes sure, exactly sure. the melody. And sometimes I'll get the piano down, and if I hear what the guitar solo is, I record it right away so I don't forget it. Because if old guys do two things, they <laughs> lose stuff and they forget <laughs> stuff. <laughs> or young guys who you have had multiple mini strokes. I'm losing my mind over here. Right. Train of well, thought. <laughs> So I'm with you at, at that point, most times it all starts coming to me really fast. I don't know. I've been blessed that I can hear most everything that's supposed to happen. Nice. And like, 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 like literally the drum part, I went straight to the little, uh, click and side stick thing mm-hmm. into a snare as part of it. It wasn't all 
side stick in one verse and then snare and sure. another. It was, I mean, just these kind of things. I it's very much a blessing. Do you feel I it pretty why. instinctually as you're right. well, starting? It all starts to kind of flow, snowball. I started playing when I was 11, and I've listened intently and been in bands my entire life where I've learned so much really great music that all it, it kind of inherently builds in you the mm. the arrangements the how parts fit together um choice of parts for the kind of song that it's nice yeah. all those kinds of things just over time I mean if you're not decent at it by the time you're 62 you should probably quit making people listen to you <laughs> that's funny you know so so, so I you start on piano and then um, I, on this one Yep. I start on guitar on songs. Yeah. There are times that I've got the melody and I have to figure out what key it's in. Okay. Because I can kind of hum the melody along. It'll be going along in my head and I won't have a lyric. I've got four songs started that I don't have a lyric for. Right? It happens, huh? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And then other times I wrote the entire lyrics for two songs when I was working on my Hurricane Ruth album while I was walking around a school that I worked at, opening up the doors at six o'clock in the morning. Oh, just man. had a piece of paper in my hand and I wrote two whole songs just, lyrically before I had done anything. I it just the the idea of what I wanted to talk about was that. Right on. So you get the keys for this one. Um now is that piano part what's on the final release or Yes. Okay, yes, cool. It is. So it's you're I mean, committed the, to giving a, a a great performance from the beginning. Um you track the keys. What comes after the piano for this one? what came next for me was drums nice. i wanted the feel because once i established that in the bass and the dynamic of it how much i wanted the piano to mm -hmm. be exposed in places and then where i knew other instruments were going to take over because i don't want a song to be piano led all the way through i don't think there's nice. enough of what you would call interest you know we create yeah. a lot of things interest wise as mixers with delay and verb throws and different a lot of different things but as a writer you have yeah. to do the same thing and how you're going to put it together after that um i had the solo i mean i i, I the guitar solo was the next thing i knew where i was going to place it i didn't have the bridge for this song until after i went back and started going to this men's group that gotcha. that and the ending verses all of that. That's it, right. I remember when it you came was to me, you said, it, I, this isn't finished because I still don't have the bridge. But then, yeah, you started your men's group. Right. and uh, Beautiful and it, bridge, too. Man, powerful. I, and I, I try very hard to make the emotion of the instruments push almost like old uh, old mixes from the 60s and 70s, mm -hmm. where things were almost over the top. But they spoke to you like what the lyrics were speaking to you as, or if there was no lyric there, it was taken over and being as big and dynamic and strong as the singer mm -hmm. and the lyrics that were being delivered. Those strings come to mind at the bridge, how they just kind of fly up and right. sit over top of the track. So you, you mentioned the drums, but what's your, uh, <laughs> you have all of them pretty much, but what's your, right. what's the drum? I would say, what's your favorite? What did you go to for this song? Uh, we tried a few, didn't we? Oh yeah, and and I ended up mixing and matching a little bit in it. Um, I've used Slate longer than anything, mm -hmm. but I have uh, Superior Drummer. Um, Get Good Drums, they're modern and massive. It's an incredible Great, yeah. thing. And I have so much uh, in the way of Trigger 2 samples, mm -hmm. you know, but um, I also have an old, believe it or not, 32-bit that I have to run a bridge for of... Uh, zildjian symbols oh, that zildjian recorded and i love them that's and awesome I, I love them and and there there are places where i will strip anybody's symbols out to get oh to the these. days so, of going to guitar yes. center and they had the this the sample glass case you know and you can open up and you're looking you can't hear anything you can't try it out or you don't know what they're going to sound like but you're like oh this guy recorded with you know, and whoever, and you're looking through, and it's got, oh, it's got 300 different symbol samples, and we take the CD, go back, and then those were our yeah, samples. Yeah, very man. early on. Oh, man. So I was fortunate I met somebody at Sweetwater who literally used their recording studio 
and he would sample some stuff out and send me a couple grooves to let me hear what it sounded like. And I oh, could make cool. purchase a little bit more informed. That's <laughs> awesome. So yeah. you, uh, I think you started with Steven Slate drums with this one. And then I asked, can we use Superior? Was that right? I, I don't yes, know. If, indeed. And so we moved and, over well, Superior. And I wasn't happy because the Slate drums weren't being dynamic enough. It, did, it didn't seem like I was getting the soft tones that I wanted. And then the hard hits, it seemed like they didn't quite have the bottom end I wanted either. Which, if I remember, made I, I swear, the Blackbird, said, I don't think you, did you have the Blackbird at that point? I didn't have you it. didn't have it at that point. I, I told you, I was I like, did not have the Blackbird it. has got the best velocity range dynamics of anything I've ever mm -hmm. worked with. Um, but I was a long time, Tune Track, Easy Drummer, Drum Kit from Hell, the original. Yeah, you didn't even too. have a GUI. You just had the orange pads or whatever on the screen. Um, so, uh, but I uh, I have not gone to, to, what is it, Superior Drummer 3 now? Um, I still have yeah. two, but very I'm, similar. I'm uh, just a lot better. The sounds and, man, the, the control is insane. And three, so we moved to Tune Track Superior Drummer 3. And it uh, wasn't without our quirks and glitches and issues well, and exporting were, and that, but... It, but truly, the, the thing that you brought that I wasn't hearing was more variation in velocity than what I had. Mm. It wasn't like I had one velocity, but you were like, look, let's try to get this instead of being... Feeling like a live drummer, even more to, so. To four, yeah. to two, to four. And... and where I had ghost notes everywhere and like what belonged, they just weren't audio wise dynamic enough. Mm. Yeah, know, yeah, we did. I, so we you, get in and we, uh, we tweaked snare ghost notes. We added, we changed kick patterns. Um, not a ton, but enough that it made a difference. Um, again, I'm, I'm a huge mm -hmm. fan of collaboration. Um, I even mixing, I get in and I'm mixing a song yeah, I've done this professionally for how many years now, but I still feel like when I send it off to my man, Joey Fernandez, my mastering engineer, one of my best friends, and he listens and he comes back and says, um, I'm missing 1K, I'm missing the guitars, there's no instruments, it's just drum, bass, and vocal. I'm like, <sighs> takes takes a hit to the emotions, but then it's like, yeah, he's right, he's right, and then get back to work. Mm -hmm. And so we, we went through a little bit of that with the drums, um, but uh, they turned out great, incredible. And I, I prefer, I think the way you were working was so that those tune track sounds were going to be the final sounds and the dynamics would sit on top of the mix. And the way I prefer, and we kind of went this way, is I like to have a natural, what a real drummer is going to give me, and then enhance that with samples. Don't try to do too much with your drum programming Make that sound choice, and so. feel like a human and then enhance it like we do in the mixing phase. Uh, well, you know what? Yeah. I had a I had an exceptional e kit in this house. Mm. One drummer in six years played it. Oh jeez. <laughs> it's just that hard to get people to do things. Yeah. And drummers that, you know, I had a guy a, a band send me a whole album. I did the whole album and replaced every last thing. Yeah, Symbols, toms, every drum, the whole thing. But that it's it's a, it's a hard thing to get around, and so and I'm not a drummer. I mean, I could hear it, I can do it, but I won't always get it exactly right. Yeah, you know, I mean, I'm I'm willing to admit that, and I have drummers listen to my stuff, and eventually, my two main guys that I go to, one who played on my first album, like there you go, nice. now you're there. Yeah, and it took it took having somebody else listen to it and say, wait a minute, let's, let's consider this. Nice. And not, ah, Shep, that's bad. You, <laughs> you have a very gracious way of approaching things like that. No, I appreciate that. I, I would say all of our preference would probably be a great drummer with a real drum kit in an incredible sounding room where we move the kit around the room and we, you know, the parts are going to mm -hmm. be controlled. You know, it's going to hit the shells hard and the cymbals not as hard. So they don't get that crashy, harsh, you know, thing you get the quality from the symbols, right? Great. <laughs> so we're all working with world class drummers and world class. No, of course not. So uh, I've worked with heavy bands where it made more sense. The drummer was great, but the kick pattern was so complicated that we had to throw an e kick, an electronic kick, and route that to the drum software so that we knew we can correct the timing of that, and we didn't get a bunch of kick bleed in the room mics and stuff. 
and that works for some projects, but um, it's great when you have it's it's I don't know it's hard to come by and a, a good drummer who's not great but is comfortable on an electronic drum kit. Uh, they're bed, way better nowadays than they used to be. But um, oh mine, I had a lot of money in it. ATV symbols. I oh, mean, I believe it. Uh, DW five thousand double kick. I mean, oh man, okay. <laughs> you went all it, out it and it still ended up being. Yeah. And now, do you do? Uh, it's do gone. you play with your fingers with pads, or do you draw in and program? Uh, I do it both ways. Okay, I do it both ways. If I really feel a groove, I will sit down and do like uh, kick and snare, and yeah. I'll use two fingers on the snare mm -hmm. if it's like kind of ghosty, and then. If there's a specific place that I want an accent on the hi hat, I'll go over and hit the open hi hat, and then nice. I go back and change it to the the opened and then close. And then always tweak it until yeah, until yeah. it's done. Right, right. But right I mean, I don't think I'm that bad considering I've never sat down and played a set of drums formally in my life. No, the drums turned out really nice. <laughs> um, you. I think one of the things that I came in and helped with was I think you were giving it a little bit too much, um, too fancy, L trying to do a little bit too much maybe with the drum part, being a little more, I don't know, funk. Um, you, had, uh, you had a lot of intricate parts, and I felt like it was pulling the the emotion from the vocal the song the story to hey look at me i'm the drummer and i can play really good drums and so we kind of simplified it if anything and pulled things back and took out some kicks and uh but but it, you got you got to admit there was that point where all of a sudden once the vocals and everything oh, were yeah. there that you could hear it that the accents that i had chosen and the bass parts playing oh, yeah. with it and what the strings did they were they seemed off to listen to it but they fit, and I I don't like things to be like mainstream down the middle, yeah. commercial, easy. Yeah. I like when seven feels like four. Yeah, you yeah. Know? Well, you're a true musician. <laughs> I like to play a bar <laughs> a bar of seven and a bar of six, and people say, "Wow, that's thirteen beats," but boy, it sure sounds like sixteen. Yeah, it it felt great. I, I love the way that it. It's it got to be fresh and, and new, or I'm just not happy. I don't yeah. know. I, and that's part of you get bored what easy, takes don't me you, so John? long. <laughs> well, I just, I know what I want to hear, and it takes me a long time to pull it out when you're not a real drummer. Gotcha, and yeah. I, I Well, it worked out. All Shep Band has its downsides. <laughs> yeah, right. So, uh, program drums through and through. Um, we, I think, what did I do? So, maybe we'll have a an exclusive video in the VIP where we'll break apart. Actually, we got the full set of videos they're uploading today for anyone uh, in VIP. You'll be able to watch this and then go watch all the videos of my mix, breaking down every single processing and, and hear and follow it and then mix a song for yourself. Uh, but I think what we ended up doing was I, um, I did change the kick, but I blended snares. So we kept the ghosting and the snare top. We kept, you actually provided two snare tops. Uh, you had an X snare in Superior. You have the option to uh, to blend other samples within the software. You did that. And then um, I enhanced it with two or three more, some room sounds. I, I'm not a big fan, you and I talked about this, of um, sending a snare to a reverb track. There's some great reverbs out there, Valhalla, you name it. Like there's great reverb sounds. But uh, I love pulling in, whether it's the Blackbird or the plethora of samples that we have uh doing this kind of uh try to use a word that's not what i'm thinking but uh i'll say it i'm a, I'm a sample whore like i just i love <laughs> collecting samples right and so uh going through that we picked out some samples i like i prefer to use room sounds real recorded samples in a room and then blend those in instead of using a snare verb uh and then with trigger two we can control the tightness of it with the, the decay um, and the, um, what is it, the, the ADSR, right? So you got the decay right. and the sustain that we can control independent of one another. Really tighten up the kick without using a gate. Increase the sustain um, through transient shaping and whatnot. But anyways, and then, blah, blah, blah. We got the drum sounding incredible. Um, and I think you emulated a lot of what I did in, in your drum sound. I just heard your final mix. It sounded great. Um, yeah, things were a little bit different. I mean, you guys have to, if there's one thing that I want to make clear is that my mix does not exactly sound like David's no. because David was going through a lot of stuff. 
you know, and it's totally not his fault. And I wanted to keep pushing myself and I've, I've not been strong about making commitments to things and learning to be happy with things and pushing forward and seeing what I can do with choices I've made. Mm. If that makes sense to some of you guys out there, as far as like having confidence of what you're doing, but this really helped me to learn to make decisions and, you know, like the decision to change and buy new piano sounds and new string sounds. And I didn't change the parts that I wrote. No, the MIDI stayed the same sound changed though and so that was pretty important to me to get to that point in mixing this while david was very under the weather multiple ways what's just yeah we you know, uh, just I mean, alluded for full, to. full transparency uh over the last <laughs> few years i've had a couple of mini strokes we've pinned it down to uh caffeine and then long story short uh it ended up becoming more than just caffeine and during john and i's time working together uh what is it two or three in the span of a couple of weeks and uh i don't i'm doing much better now which is why we're doing this interview now uh i'm not slurring my speech as much and my vision and there i go slurring my speech but my vision is coming back but um yeah it's kind of it was almost a blessing in disguise i would say because we had a great we started together strong and then when i went down it caused john to experiment and he ended up doing a lot of the trial and error and swapping sounds and things like that uh which brought us to a a really great final mix we got our mix done finally and then um his mix so again i'm gonna leave a link you guys can check that out the before and after his original production demo versus my mix and then versus his final mix um and actually i think i'm gonna put a couple of his revisions in there because he was chasing a certain sound this is maybe worth sharing he had a song um I forget what's uh, down here. Is that the band name? Let me rediscover yeah. you. Rediscover you. Yes. And that was my rough. You were fixated on that. That's the sonics of it. And uh, you're very passionate about pursuing that. You had a couple revisions where you were close with the sonics, but things like your bus compression um, were over the top. And so I was there to to kind of guide you and say, hey, uh, what was it that I, I I told you? I'll let you explain it maybe whenever you sent that mix. And we were, y- yes, we were in uh, text mode mm-hmm. and I sent it and you listen and you're like, do me a favor, turn all your bus compression off. I don't care how quiet it is. Yeah. I just want to hear how you're mixing this. And you're like, the mix is great. There's yeah. Really nothing wrong with your mix it was a night and day difference between but i've never had a template yeah i've never had a template because yeah i admit i'm not a pro tools guy i'm studio one guy and i work on a pc and so i can't just get these things from anybody sure i'm eventually gonna have to work with it and you've helped me to slowly bring in the right compressors and the right amounts of it and doing more compression kind of browerizing a little bit sure sure which you know you kind of use a little bit of that in your method but at the end of the day less was more oh big because, time yeah i mean only a db only a db never more than a db well it, there's a time and place that to finally smash. got me there there's a time and place to smash something and there's a time and place for a db or two and right you reminded me of the jjp uh, not a quote, but a situation he talks about in some of his interviews where um, he had a band and their mix sounded god awful. They he goes in and he just turns off all the plugins and now it starts to sound musical again. And that's it. Just I thought, you know, you're trying to do too much, and and it's hard because you spend money on these plugins, you buy into the marketing, and I'm not saying that that there's not great tools out there. There's incredible tools. We're so spoiled. We're very blessed nowadays with the amount of tools and options we have for EQs, compression, and you know, fill in the blank. Um, but it's tempting when, I, and I was guilty of this at the start of this mix. I had just got Kush's new Kush Audio's uh, Bliss. Is that the name of the the saturator, or whatever? And I was I'm throwing it on everything. On yeah, so <laughs> it sounds great, but you get to a point where it's like, okay, well, I just bought that, and I just got this bundle, so I need to use all of it. And no, you don't. A lot of times, sometimes a track is filled up with inserts on a mix of mine. Sometimes there's nothing on it. And it's experiencing that throughout the years and, and you know, uh, I don't know, 10,000 hour rule, whatever, something like that. 
that uh, you get to a point where you learn what does it need? Is it worth chasing that sound? Or is it where we just need to leave it alone? And uh, yeah, so we went through a little bit of that. But we turned off the bus comp- compression, the bus processing. It was actually more than just bus Me, compression. And if it I can bring incredible. up something about yeah. the bus. Yeah. Those hits of a snare, those hits of a synth, mm. those cymbal crashes, those things that are very much uh, transient, yeah. strong. I could not, no matter what I put on the source in the bus that I would send it to, the uh, mix A or mm-hmm. the two bus, I couldn't put enough compression to stop those things from happening. Mm. And what I ended up finding in the long haul was that a lot lighter compression, more of it along the way, and then just like tweaking individual hits with volume fades mm. got me a lot closer to not having the compressor overreacting. Gotcha. Yep. And I had two compressors that didn't have the ability to uh, high pass. Mm. And so I was hitting okay. compressors with too much low that. end. Yep. Yeah. And so all these things together. So the comp- I remember that. I told you, it was like, it sounds like your compressor is yes. reacting to the low end. You want that extra low end, which I, I love a big bottom end, but you need to use a, a bus compressor that's going to allow you to not, not, you know, you hear guys say, let's high pass 100 hertz. No. 30, 40, 50 hertz, just something to get that the right. subs out of the compression so you get a more balanced reaction of the needle to the kick and snare and not just I wasn't I wasn't taking it out at either the track or the bus level. Mm. Things that it doesn't have to go to get your low end. It doesn't have to yeah. go to mix A or the two bus. And I was making a bad mistake in all that. And you helped me realize that it's that's part of it. I mean, because sure. once I stripped off, I could hear where the extra low end was coming from. Yep. I wasn't hearing it right because everything was too smashed together. Absolutely. You know? and, well, and and, and I, think, I don't hear compression well. Yeah. And here's the thing: I mix through my uh, clipping into limiting. That's not always what I use in the final master, but I mix through that and. Once I get the mix kind of going, I pull up a parallel compressor. If the song's calling for a, you know, bigger, louder, fuller, fatter sound, we'll go there. But um, when you're learning and you haven't established that, because I have my template and my workflow is it's set. Um, doesn't mean I don't get creative. It helps me get creative faster in a mix whenever I've got my workflow established. I have a system. For you, you're still kind of establishing what your system is going to look like. And so that's why I suggested let's turn off that bus processing and let's figure out putting the cart before the horse a little bit. Let's go back and let's establish the sound a little bit better then into the the bus processing. Because like you alluded to, if you if you go to one of my mixes and you turn off the clipping into limiting my my loudness processing, right, that kick and snare is going to be way too loud. But if I don't use the loudness processing and I mix with that kick and snare at a lower, more balanced level, then it goes to mastering and then it's not enough. So you need that. I'm, I'm a huge fan of mixing to have a final radio release sound, the, the final mastered sound. But for the, for the journey of learning, it's important to kind of build it from a foundation. And so we did that and made a huge difference, incredible difference for you, I think, from from turning that off, hearing it. And then you battled some some sonic issues, some EQ. You were chasing the mid-range of the the reference, but um, completely different the source The top track. end especially. Yeah, the top end. And, my mix is brighter than yours, and yeah. I, wanted, I wanted that. I mean, like you said, it's a multi-million dollar all professional production that that down here put together and it was That's years Mark ago Mart- yeah and it if was a anybody live doesn't know mark martell is the guy that is like the freddie mercury oh yeah guy. he yeah great he sounds mind. just like freddie so you know i mean world-class vocalist on top of it for sure but what that's what made me smile for the first time because you know i was discouraged i was oh, disgusted yeah. that i couldn't get anywhere with this and it wasn't until you told me hey turn off all this and let me hear what you have before it hits the back end. I couldn't believe it was 
sonically, I need to, maybe I'll play a, a snippet of it here uh, for people who are still with us watching the, the full interview, but um, right. what a difference it made to the sonics of the track. Um, and, and and that's not to say top-down mixing or whatever my, my friend Graham Cochran and a lot of guys who promote that, um, it's not to say that doesn't work, but you got to build that foundation and develop your system, how you're going to, because are you going to EQ top end at the two bus? Well, then you pull in a sample that's got a bunch of top end to the kick or snare, and now you're going to be backwards mixing, taking out top end and things like that. I, you know, I did that for years. I've gone to more of um, VMR, the virtual mix bus, whatever the console, that's on my virtual mix bus is on my two bus from the beginning, a clipper into a limiter. The limiter has no threshold. It, I just I've hit hard. I mix hot into it. Um, the clipping gives me that loudness, and I, I would say sometimes I don't even end up using bus compression because I end up hitting the track so hard uh, individually that I don't need it, or it would cause problems if I did try to use it. So a little tiny bit kissing the needle kind of thing. But um, I, I I don't know. I just I prefer that sound, especially if you're learning to establish the sound from the tracks not be committed and stuck with this you know two bus processing that should change i feel like from song to song unless you're mixing the same genre in and out day in and day out and you're always doing the same thing by all means you're going to have your booster bottom booster top and have your staple template two bus but um i'm not john you've gone served clients you've done your own music and so you're bouncing from from different genres and different vibes acoustic to full band um same here i go from gospel to heavy rock to hardcore to um you know country and so it doesn't make sense for me personally to have the same settings for the two bus so anyways little little rant there but as as and as far as what you said with the clip i was totally ignorant i'd never used a clipper in my life Mm. And until you showed me, watch this, only let this clip maybe a dB and a half for your style of music. And I got where that clipper was reacting that way. Mm. And it was, and I did, wasn't boosting the signal with it. I wasn't doing anything, but managing how it would clip the material going into the, to the, uh, I use like you do the, yeah. the L2. The Fab, you know, filter, the Fab Filter Pro L2. Yeah. Yes. That changed everything for me and all of a sudden i noticed some of those transients were reduced mm. yep and so anybody that doesn't have it's cheap casrog right is that that's k clip three yeah the k clip i just upgraded yes. because you couldn't get two so i was like oh, i'll upgrade but i used two for years um uh, one and then two but now yeah k k clip three um there's a couple there's my favorite i don't have it but it's the boss clipper um that one is ridiculous he makes incredible tools uh boz's clipper i think is the best uh there's a couple of modes in there that can't be beat uh but there's now limiters that have uh, what's the new the the new what's slate's limiter that took for years years to update um oh has he actually updated fgx got got an update it's got a gui update and a full it's brand new from the ground up and that so it's not fgx2 yep Finally, it's out. So, uh, yeah, there's lots of, like, like I said earlier, we're spoiled with tools, but, um, clipping into limiting great thing. I've got a whole video I'll link above or put it below. You guys can check that out. Um, where I talk about loudness processing and using parallel compression into clipping into limiting. And then I got a whole course mastering in the box that shows the entire process and walks you through multiple masters and how I approach it. So definitely check that out. But okay. So two bus, we covered that vocals, drums. Um, talk to me a little bit about bass and guitar. How are you recording those? Um, DI for the bass or you have an amp? I run directly. I have a, an Apollo twin USB. Cool. Yeah. And, I run directly in, and then I will split the DI off to another track and run a UAD uh, amplifier nice. or, or other VSTI. No amplifiers, real amplifiers or microphones were used for any bass or any guitar. The guitar, again, goes in, and uh, a lot of it, the guitars I record with the unison 
uh, amplifiers and I actually record the tone. Commit I it. don't, yeah. I, yeah, I commit it. Uh, and because I'm, I'm well, you know, 50 years of playing guitar. Oh yeah. You know, I, 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 I pretty much know what I want. And if I miss, I don't miss by so much that I have to go back and replay it for sure. But that no amplifiers again. So, I mean, it, and in my world, I'm in an 11 by 11 room. It's, it's well tuned, but I'm in my house and my wife, doesn't like it loud. No, yeah. <laughs> so That's I, I'm in. I basically have the uh, master out version of the 650s, and so I record with these on. Even though I probably get a little more bleed than I should, I'm so used to the tone. I just count on it. I don't use anything closed back and change what I hear because. And this is probably one of the biggest thing is learning to really trust what you're hearing. Yeah. And then stick them with it, mm. you know, go with it. Commit. I, I have stopped. I have killed myself with second guessing. And you reach the point that you really like your mix. And then somebody says two or three small things and you go back and try to reinvent it because you feel like that's more important than all the work you just did. And yeah, I've had to learn to, you can't move forward if you're always going back and fixing things. Sure. Big time. Changing things. You know, I, and I've learned to become more satisfied with my work from, and you've told me, just do it. You got to stop second guessing yourself. You know, you slow yourself down with that more than you do having trouble creating the sound. And that's true. Yeah. And that, that's something that, you know, build your confidence over time. You know, you and I working together, hearing, you know, me legitimately say, hey, sounds great. You don't need to change that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I think that builds your confidence as well when you have people who you, respect or you like the sound of their mixes tell you that something you've done sounds good um <clears throat> helps you to stop second guessing so much but uh you, you alluded to guitars and ocd won't let me not say this uh for you, those of you guys recording guitars out there <clears throat> excuse me a great technique is to record the di and like john alluded to split it off for the bass uh, and have the amp tone if you are recording, let's say you're a recording engineer and you're recording maybe an average guitarist or you know there's going to be some editing that you're going to need to do. Uh, Elastic Audio and Pro Tools or whatever DAW, it's really tough with the amount of harmonic content that's in a guitar amp, especially distorted guitars, to um, manipulate the timing of a distorted guitar. So what I've done over the years is record the DI, split it off through an ABY or, or whatever, and use the DI as your editing track because you get a more defined transient from the DI track and then group it with the amp track so that when you move things, you're using the DI and that sharper transient uh, to make it happen. Or, or you could always reamp it after if you get some warbling or, or that kind of thing. But uh, cool little trick there for guitars that him uh, mentioning the DI was uh, just kind of came to mind. We'll share that. But... Uh, okay, so guitars, and, bass. It, now, let me say this, and sorry to interrupt, but your bass no processing in my mix, I think, was three plugins, a gentle EQ, Saturn, FabFilter Saturn, where I used, instead of using a bunch of compression, we used the dynamics knob and increased the sustain and multiband. I don't know if there was a third. I don't know what it would have been. For me, the FabFilter uh, multiband was mm. what finally got the the tonal variations you know frequency wise mm -hmm. from the deep low notes on you know because i'm playing a five string yeah and getting a balance that way instead of so much fader riding it really helped to smooth it out for me i mean it, but yeah that saturn i'd never had it before and i bought it on on what you showed me it did in your mix oops and it <laughs> helped mine <laughs> hey <laughs> As, you know, not I try everybody. Not to, I, I mean, not I'm not rich, that, but <laughs> <laughs> but I'm I'm not rich. But if at 62, there's a lot less chance I've got the next 30 years to make music. Oh man! So I'm going to use what I have as soon as I can, if I have the resources to do it. And my wife's not going to cut my throat for spending too much money. It's all good. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's hilarious. Because I want to, I want to do this. I love doing this. What's I, that? Uh, passionate oh, about it. 
I've got a meme. I don't know if I sent this to you or not. It's uh, what's it's a picture of a guitar in this little local style guitar shop, and it's got a note on the guitar. Um, guitar cost is you know fifteen hundred dollars, but for an additional fifty bucks, we'll give you a receipt that knocks off you know a thousand bucks, so that you can give that to your wife. <laughs> so you pay the thousand, and then you pay a separate. <laughs> horrible, horrible. Uh, you have to be really good at pulling just a little bit of money out at a time and putting it in a rat hole. <laughs> there you go. That's hilarious. So uh, drums, guitars, bass, uh, keyboards. We talked about strings, modern scoring, the uh, synths and whatnot. What's your go-to synthesizer? I used, okay, so for the very end of it, I used, uh, and I absolutely love the uh Oh, what what's the company that makes a keyscape? Mm. Um, gosh, I don't know why I can't say it. It's got the orb controller thing within it. High end I thing. I don't know why I can't say the name of it to save myself. Um, Spectrosonics. Spectrosonics. Uh, they're synth. I okay. love that thing. There's so much in it. But believe it or not, um, Omnisphere. I also have yes, Omnisphere. Okay, I cool. have Omnisphere too, but. I also have um, a little 49 key um, Akai keyboard, nice. and it comes with VIP3 okay. software. And I used some of their sounds, and some of their sounds I used in different ways where, like, I didn't use the filters in it. I ran the audio in and used filters in the DAW. In Studio One. To, 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 to shape it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So nice. It and it's 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 never gonna be the same thing. And sometimes I don't use synths at all. Um, you heard strings. I love horns every bit as much. And I mixed a band where I it was the all shep band for two acoustic guitar players that sang, a guy and a girl. Um, I think you might have heard money is yep. from me. Um, but that kind of stuff, I mean, I, I I always want it to be different. I want it to utilize real instruments as opposed to synthesize instruments i like the natural instrument i'm just a, a big fan of it i'm old school that way well you did a great job of making vstis sound real obviously we're spoiled with tools but it takes Ooh. a pretty penny you spent it and uh, i think it turned out great your commitment to getting the sound that you had in your head uh second to none from who i've worked with i really appreciated that about you and uh we'll let you know People hear that again. Check out the links in the description. You can go hear the before and the after of John's transformation. But um, I don't know what what uh, maybe what's a a brief summary of how you feel, where you're at with the finish line, and and where you were to where you are now. I really feel this t for me comes down to all the work I'm going to do going forward. I feel like I'm seventy five percent if not 90% closer to having a template that I can work with that the sounds that come back at me because of the fact that like you do, mm. I kind of mix into that. I get that finished sound as I'm recording the song. It's, it's going to speed up my process. It's going to help me to just be pleased. I play something, I record it and it sounds good. I know it is. I'm not going back. I'm going to work better. That's yeah. what this is. This whole thing has been for me coming into your discipleship is that you're helping me to hone my process, even though my process isn't just as a mixer. You understand it because you yourself are a musician. You yourself have done the other side of the mixing console. And Absolutely. so you understand my needs to make this work for me. And then, you know, I, I call everything I do now room for one. And there's two reasons. My studio at 11 by 11 is just room for me. And then room for one, the one that's in here. There you go. So <laughs> uh, if you wait, wait if, if you see my song out there and it's stopped by room for one featuring Warren Passaro, it's your friend, Shep. There you go, man. Well, John, it was an absolute pleasure working on this song with you. Uh, I'm excited. We got another song we're going to work on in the discipleship. But for those of you watching, if you want to get your hands on those tracks, you want to download them and mix it for yourself, uh, feel free. You got the link down below, the VIP from the Mix Academy, and you're going to be able to get your hands on it and 
do put your taste to the test. We're going to put your uh, your hands on the song and let you mix it for yourself. The videos will be there for you to follow along and beg, borrow, steal from what I did. We'll maybe uh, do maybe something else with John showing off some of his process. But uh, there you go. So John Shepard, stop from the Mix Academy. John, you are the man. Thank you again so much for sharing the song with us and for your time here to uh, discuss your process. And uh, look forward to doing the next one with you. I thank you so much for helping me grow and shape my musical products. Nah. Very much appreciate you, brother. It's been a blast. Well, guys, thank you so much. And we'll see you in the next one.